Hi, everyone. Before the episode begins, I just want to remind you to follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Marlene the Plant Lady and YouTube, Everything Gardening with Marlene Simon. And remember, please, please, please rate and review on iTunes and Spotify. That just helps the podcast get a notice by more people and then more people will become better gardeners. And that's what we all want. So enjoy the episode. Look at that plant. I want you to know that everything was grown in my garden. Don't touch that plant! Is it poisonous? She'll become part of the plant. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Flower Power Garden Hour. I'm your host, Marlene. And today we are going to talk about fruit trees. We're going to talk a little bit about stone fruits and citrus. And um, there's no better person to talk about that than Don Shore. He's been on before. You know, he's the owner of Redwood Barn Nursery in Davis, California. But oh my gosh, he is a wealth of knowledge. And I have a funny <laughs> story, Don, before we go on. So Don, <laughs> Don, welcome again. Thanks for joining me. Great to be here. And I think this came about because I was doing, of course, bare root planting um, for Good Day Sacramento. And I'm like, I need a bare root tree. And I run into Redwood Barn and you have bare root tree. And then I'm like, I'm just going to ask him this random question that I'm so confused about, about fire blight. But I'm not going to go into that now. But I'm just saying that's how this 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 got <laughs> scheduled. And then, you know, we started talking. And I'm like, well, you know, yeah. let's hold this. But another funny story is. I think it was before we started recording on the last episode, when you joined me, you happened to mention, hey, is that Wellwitchia still in that terracotta tube at the conservatory? And I said, and I said, yes, wow, funny. We literally the day before, we're just trying to figure out how long it's been in there. And you're like, well, I was an intern. I put it in there in 1976 or, um, yep. so you'll be happy, you'll be happy to know we transplanted it into a deeper pot. And now that is a big part of my story. When I, you know, first of all, I'm like, Hey, everyone, if you're from Davis, do you know Don Chur from Redwood Barn? And then everyone's just like, Oh, I love him. He's so smart. Oh my God. I'm like, yes. (laughs) And then I tell him the story, how we had no idea in that it's been there that long. And then I feel old because especially when people are like, oh my God, that's been. Wait, you feel old? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. I did work in the Botany Conservatory many years ago and those well witches were memorable then. They're very memorable now. Yes. They're actually <laughs> so popular now. We just had a student do a logo of the well witches because <laughs> it's out, it, you know, it's like a lot of people now have the corpse plant. Um, Mm -hmm. Our previous, I think, logo was cycads. And as we're transplanting them today, I'm like, I hate cycads. But (laughs) (laughs) the well, which is great. But I thought I I thought I had to pass that on you now are part of the uh, the tour just by uh, (laughs) by that. But we're not here to talk about well, which is or um, we're talking about plants. Probably most people have or a lot of people have. Mm -hmm. I mean, every homeowner wants to produce their own fruit. Um, as you know, a, a, a peach picked right off a tree or nectarine is so much better than most in the store, um, especially if you have a good palate and you yeah. can tell the difference. It's, uh, it's better than almost anything. I think a fresh peach picked off your tree in the summer is one of the best reasons for living in the Sacramento Valley. Uh, there you go. I'm going to say a nectarine, but hey, what is okay. the difference between nectarine and peach? Fuzz. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so really, yeah. it's just semantics, right? Also, um, also the name of your show, this is very, very appropriate. These are the trees that are just beginning to bloom right now. And one of the beautiful things about the Sacramento Valley is the thousands of acres of almonds, and not just almonds, apricots and peaches and plums all coming into full bloom. Oh, the weather's been a little dicey this year, but they are beautiful in the orchards on the sunny days. Yeah, so for those who aren't familiar, <laughs> and I know there's been so much, you know, harsh weather and we can't complain about our weather, but we had snow in the intercoastal uh, mountain ranges that are only like at 500, 1500 feet. And it just happened to correspond with some of the almond blooms. And I, uh, I have a picture last year of where there was icicles hanging off of the almond blooms because we also had a very cold snap at the same time. So how does that, and let's just how if people have fruit trees blooming, 
And we do have these cold spells. I think there's a lot of people who see in in Florida where they spray trees with cold to help with that. That's something that a homeowner shouldn't really bother with. Um, no, it shouldn't go no, that's it. not that's not really going to do anything. It just just helps you understand how tough tough it can be to be a farmer. And in fact, last year that frost at this time, many almond growers lost thirty to forty percent of their crop. And so, if some of them were really hit hard by it, and now they're looking at another year with some real challenges. Aside from water standing in their orchards after all the rainfall that we've had, that's less of an issue. But the cold and overcast and rain uh, during the bloom period can and really set back their pollination and I hate to say in your own orchard as well and of course there's nothing much you can do about that if the sun isn't shining European honeybees don't fly and if it's raining they won't get any pollination of the seven days right now we've had of the non perel almond variety that's the premier almond variety that they get the most money for their first day of pollination they've really had has been today and so they're having a real challenge I'd imagine getting the, the nut set that will make them money and as a home gardener you may have that problem as well people need to understand the ups and downs of the weather and we are planting a tree that blooms in February and into early March and we can have rain and very cold temperatures at that time. We usually don't so usually they're great but every now and then something does go wrong not just for farmers but also for home gardeners. And we might as well just jump on talking about weather inflicting uh, fruit set because yeah. I think that it could be something huge with citrus when people say and, and I'm jumping into citrus now just because we're talking about fruit set, but it's, you know, when someone says, wow, I had tons of citrus last year. Um, first, mm -hmm. are citrus alternate bearing? And can you explain what that means? And two, um, what happens when we either have heavy rain, hot, dry mm -hmm. wind? Um, you know, people have to think back a few months to when their fruit would set. Right. When the flower buds initiate, I mean, the first thing is that many fruit trees initiate their flower buds in the late summer, early fall. If you think back to September of 2022, we had a week of temperatures above 105. Two of those days were 116 in Davis and 110 on one day. So we had an extreme heat event that could well have had some impact on flower bud initiation on any of a number of fruiting trees. Uh, citrus, fortunately for the farmers, bloom later. They bloom in March. March, April, uh, so they're less likely to be hit by a frost here in California. But there can be the phenomenon that you just asked about, alternate bearing, and it's strongest on mandarins, particularly on Satsuma mandarin, or Owari Satsuma is the best known variety. I have several of those on my farm. This was a high set year, so each tree had 400 to 600 fruit on it. In a light year, I'll get as few as 100 on each tree. That is how severe alternate bearing can be. doesn't matter that much to you or me if we go back and forth that way, but if you're making your living, that can certainly be a challenge. Actually, it's not that well understood exactly what's going on with alternate bearing. It just seems to be an energy conservation process in the tree, uh, but it's known in Owari Satsuma Mandarin and the other Satsuma types, some of the clementines, and interestingly, apricots and persimmons are well known for it, and pecans are well known for it. But any of a number of other fruit trees can do it to some degree, just a sort of a natural heavy years alternated with light years. Seems to be triggered in the case of citrus when you get something like a major freeze event, 1990, 1998, where we got cold enough to do significant damage to the citrus, they spend a year or two regrowing, then you suddenly get a gangbuster year. Just plan on having a lighter crop in, you know, in alternate years after that, that first episode sets them on that pattern. Not much you can do about it, although they, you know, far, uh, farmers have done things to reduce the crop in a heavy crop year. That must be very painful to do yeah. uh, in order to try and beat the market by having a heavy crop when everyone else has a light crop. I think home gardeners should just ride with it because, as I said, I get 100 on a mandarin instead of 400. That's still a lot of mandarins, and they're still very, very good. So it doesn't affect the quality or any Anything like that, but it is an interesting and strange phenomenon, a little hard to explain and understand. Yeah, uh, because I've worked with olive orchards before, and they're not true alternate mm. bearing, but there's definitely a decrease from one year to the next. So that's interesting that you pinpointed the persimmons, and I think you said pecans and apricots, yep. even that there are some that are just distinctly, and satsumas that are distinctly known for it. And I, yeah, and I've read stories about, oh, you've give them fertilizer at this time, but I think they're just going to do what they're going to do. There's a certain point where 
I don't know if it's good forcing them. It's almost like well, when pretty, a plant needs a Yeah, pretty much. Rest. Some of the some of the apricot growers in the Yolo County area way back in the 30s and 40s figured out ways to do it so they could beat the market and have them in the off year and some of those apricot farmers became quite wealthy. <laughs> but it was a matter of removing fruit in a good year, yeah. which I personally I have found most home gardeners aren't willing to do. So you just go, "Oh, this is a good year. All right, this is a light year, but you'll still get plenty of fruit." And I think that's an important thing to understand. We're often telling people to do things with their fruit trees to reduce fruit production, uh-huh. not necessarily on citrus, but peaches, nectarines, plums, even apricots, because we want to get better quality and have you know less of an overwhelming harvest of fruit. So I think that we should be less concerned about it, but it is an interesting phenomenon. It can be pretty extreme. I mean, having several hundred mandarins <laughs> on each tree meant the branches were hanging, yeah. and I'm probably going to have to do some corrective pruning on that. Uh, in fact, one of mine, my, my tango mandarin, some branches were actually breaking from the weight of the fruit. Fruit. So you just need to become aware of this and you may have to do some corrective work on them. Not as big a problem for home gardeners, but something to be aware of. Yeah. I, I just have to be like, ooh, Don Shore has limb breakage from heavy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, that, and interestingly, I look up Tango. I went to the citrus research sites that I like to look at. It's noted for that. It would have been wow. interesting to know that when I planted it. Now yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, see, it's not my fault. It's just That's the way right. it is. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I just wanted to like push that out there because we we're talking about the weather. Um, but let's get back to some of the the diseases that mm-hmm. people are probably going to encounter. They're going to encounter mm-hmm. every year, but possibly with a wetter year that we've been having, they may encounter them. Let's just start with peach leaf curl. Oh, for sure. In a wetter year, we're going to see more of that. And people need to remember in the last decade, most have, of the years have been drought years. So we've had very dry conditions as the peach trees were putting out their leaf buds and their flower buds. Peach leaf curl is going to happen whether you spray or not. Spray may make some difference depending on the timing, depending on how effectively you can spray. I have found most home gardeners can't really do dormant sprays very well, particularly <laughs> if they let their trees get very big. The modern materials that we sell now, I'm going to sound like an old time but the modern materials don't work as well as the older materials did. Back when fixed copper sulfate was available and lime sulfur were available, uh, they were very effective on reducing peach leaf curl. Well, they're gone from the marketplace 10, 12 years ago. They were both removed from the market. And so now you have liquid copper sprays on the plus side, easier to apply. The downside, much less effective. And a lot of people don't want to spray at all. Peach leaf curl will affect the leaves in a wet year, so I expect to see a lot of it because the timing of this rain with the, the mm-hmm. breaking of the leaf buds is just going to infect a whole lot of them. I've had years where I've had 80% leaf infection from oh, peach leaf curl. Okay, but But I want people to understand, I also had very good quality peaches and a very good yield. In our area, peach leaf curl doesn't have a big impact on yield. We now know from research in Italy, there's a very specific temperature range for infecting leaves and a very specific temperature range and moisture condition required to infect blossoms. So you can get 80% leaf infection, a lot of leaf drop, and perfectly good peaches and nectarines. You will have a tree that's weakened by having all those leaves infected. Mm -hmm. So if if you didn't get your spray on, because by the way, as we're speaking, it's already too late. If you didn't get your spray on, you'll have a lot of leaf curl. Go out and look at the tree four to six weeks after the leaves come out, and you'll find most of the leaves that are coming out are now healthy. Most of the older leaves that were affected by leaf curl have dropped. That's what you want to take care of. Keep the tree healthy. Keep it vigorous. Choose a more vigorous rootstock. In my opinion, semi-dwarf rootstocks are going to be more problematic than a regular rootstock. Uh, and, and, and give the tree you know proper care. And this is going to be a, a recurring theme. Deep watering instead of shallow, frequent watering. You know, Proper pruning. Fertilize it if you need to apply some nitrogen. In most cases, you don't, but you might need to to get some more growth on there. So don't worry about the leaf curl once it's happened because there's nothing you can do about it. I can't Mm. tell you how many times in the spring I will be saying that, especially this year. I know, I know. Um, (laughs) You're talking about fertilizer. So I think, Mm -hmm. you know, people see uh, the leaves dropping and of course they want to pick those leaves up, correct? And then if they do have heavy leaf drop, would a fertilizer be okay or should they apply a fertilizer at the first sign of heavy infestation because they know those leaves are going to drop? And and so the theory behind that is, is the plant's going to have to put on two uh, flushes of leaves. And with that, you would think it's utilizing more nitrogen than it normally would. Uh, what is yeah. your recommendation? 
Yeah, logically that would be true. And we know that you have your primary infection, which is the horrible one where you know a whole lot of the leaves are infected. Then if we get rain as the new as the tender growth is coming out, the temperatures are fairly cool because it's more of a cool season organism, then you'll get secondary infection. That's just spots on the leaves. Those will probably not fall off. That leaf is still photosynthesizing, so it's still okay. You really have to look at it kind of a case-by-case -case basis. If it's growing adequately, if it's got new growth coming, the new growth is not heavily infected because we've gotten past that primary infection, I don't think it's necessary to fertilize. But if the tree is on a semi-dwarf rootstock, if the tree has been struggling, it might be a appropriate to apply nitrogen. But I want to emphasize that's probably all you need to apply. Okay. You don't need to go out and look for a so-called balanced fertilizer. Mm -hmm. Phosphorus isn't going to make any difference. And it's almost always not just abundant here, but excessive here already. So just look for a source of nitrogen, the reasonable source. If the tree doesn't seem to be outgrowing, it doesn't seem to be putting on adequate growth in the springtime. Okay. And of, of course, once we get into the 80s, leaf curl stops. Yeah. You know, this is the good news. It's a four to five week phenomenon in a typical year. And so the tree will outgrow it. A healthy tree will give you a very good crop. And just be aware of it and, and, and keep an eye on that, that growth and make sure you're not stressing the tree by under irrigating it as you go into the late spring, early summer. I want deep waterings, orchard style waterings, and you may need to use some nitrogen. Okay. So when people bring in um, plums, pluots, and it's curl, they're like, mm. hey, I have peach leaf curl. What mm -hmm. do you tell them? <laughs> What I do then is I take the leaves, bring them in a plastic bag, please. I take the leaves and I uncurl them and show them the black aphids there that are in go. there. Okay. Because, yes, leaf curl on a plum or pluot and sometimes on apricots, but most commonly on the two you mentioned, it happens every year. It's the yeah. black aphid that gets in there. It's a hard one to control. It lasts for what I've found to be about a foot of the new growth in the spring. comes along about April and by, by early May, a whole lot of predators are typically coming in and feeding on those. I've never had to spray for that. It's actually a pretty readily controlled uh, insect by natural predators already present in your orchard, hopefully, especially yeah. if you've gardened to bring in flowers and have grasses around and things that will encourage those natural predators. It looks like leaf curl, but that's actually mm -hmm. always an aphid. Yeah, there you go. And it's also <laughs> fun. It's also fun to open up the leaf and show them the ones that have already been parasitized. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. And just just now you have to explain what they look like. Yeah. Yeah. The ones that are the ones that are parasitized are bloated and listless. Uh, and they're and they're slightly discolored. So if you see bloated, listless, discolored aphids, your problem is solving itself. And then if you look closely, you'll see an exit hole, a hole right there. So yeah. 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 Just yeah. because I know I get that question, people are like, Oh, peach leaf curl, it must affect right. peaches and nectarines. It must affect look at I have on my plum and pluot. But yeah, it's just aphids and just let it yeah. let it be. Yeah. Um, peach leaf curl specifically only goes on peaches, nectarines, and I might as well throw in nectar plums. Oh my some people gosh! Have the, some people have that interspecific hybrid between a nectarine and a plum, which, by the way, is delicious. It's oh, a wonderful wow. tree for your orchard. Well, here's but the, the question: nectarine, nectarine parentage gives you the leaf curl. Okay, wait a minute. Hold on. Is a nectar plum? Because I don't even know. Or ne nectar uh, nectar peach? Is it fuzzy or not fuzzy? It's uh, not fuzzy. You okay, would like good, it. Good. <laughs> And it really, it really is. It's one of the interspecific hybrids okay. from Zager's yeah. operation through Dave Wilson. It really is intermediate between a nectarine and a plum, in my opinion, in flavor and characteristics. Oh, that's amazing. Okay. Um, let's move on because you mentioned, and, you know, I was trying to think of things and I had shot hole fungus, but, it, you know, we could touch upon that. But you said brown rot this year is going to be yeah. horrendous uh, because it's another fungus that spread by wet conditions. Um, right. Splashing rain. Yeah. Go yeah. into what? <laughs> what uh, stone fruits? Because it's not going to affect citrus. Um, no, and this is a little confusing because there is a disease yeah. called brown rot of citrus. I know. But that's I was a just, as soon as I said yeah. it, I'm <laughs> like, oh, wait a minute, hold on. But let's go into yeah the the stone fruits. What can people if they what would they see on their plant? What are the controls they could do now? Um, probably, and then if there is there any dormant controls for it? Well, actually. Uh, Orchard operators will, you'll be seeing some helicopters out over the orchards over the next couple of weeks uh, have. because that's, have. It, it's <laughs> too muddy to drive out there. And so they're going to go out with helicopters. And they're going to be spraying the trees in bloom yep. for a brown spot. It's a, it's a post dormant spray in most cases in orchard operations. And home gardeners can do that. Um, and it will help to some degree. We've have, unfortunately, this year very favorable conditions for brown rot. Although, interestingly, the temperatures are low and that's less of a problem. So once it warms, 
warms up and we get some rain, they're going to really be spraying like crazy on the almond orchards and the apricot orchards. You can spray trees when they're in bloom, but you got to check the label very carefully. And it's usually going to be copper. You're going to skip the oil that you would usually add. And I definitely want you only doing that when the bees are not active. And so preferably at the end of the day, so you don't inadvertently spray honeybees with copper. Okay. Uh, so that would be the first thing. I think in the case of brown rot, we're going to see a lot of it. There's no question. And you'll need to monitor for it. And um, if you see it happening on a young apricot tree, you literally can do some removal, some, some pruning out of the little spurs. The main thing is to keep the rotten fruit off the ground. This is something anybody can do who's dealing with brown rot. Even if you're a fully organic gardener, you don't want to spray anything. Don't let those mummies rot up in the tree or lying on the ground after the harvest, after the season is over. They're up there right now. They're bursting little spores that are going to float over to the blossoms. And if, uh, if you talk to some real old timers, older than both of us, they'll tell you about having had long sticks and the job of going through the orchard Mm -hmm. and knocking the mummies out of the trees. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> the apricots and also the almonds because yeah. almonds that hang out there will carry brown rot over as well. Predominantly almonds and apricots, but also can happen, of course, on plums and pluots and some of the other members, other types of stone fruits. Okay. So just be prepared for that. Um, yeah. I do. I want to hit fire blight. So this is sort of what I, when I went into the nursery and I was like, you know, I'm just going to ask them. Um, mm -hmm. because, um, the UC IPM webpage, which is pretty much like the Bible of, um, I, I feel of what, mm -hmm. what oh, to yeah. do with yeah. diseases. And, um, you know, it, it, years ago I read it and it was talking about fire blight. And then down below it was saying, oh, and you know, spray with copper. And I went, well, wait a minute, copper's a fungicide and fire yeah. blight is a bacteria. And that's like, given, you know, back, you know, throwing antibiotics at a fun, you know, a fungus infection, you know, it's just, you just don't do <laughs> yeah. that. Um, but so what's your take on that? Explain what fire blight is. Cause I mean, I'm sure most people have seen it. It's very distinct. Oh, yes. After after peach leaf curl, it's the second ugliest thing that happens in your <laughs> orchard. And it happens very rapidly under very narrow temperature and moisture conditions, but very fast moving bacterial disease. Typically gets in through the blossoms. The bees bring it in on their dirty little feet. Sometimes it infects through very tender new growth and the tender growth down on the suckers at the base of the plant. So you'll see that occasionally. And it, it will blight the blossom, of course. It'll move in and kill the whole spur in, in the case of apples and pears and even run down into the main branch and on particularly susceptible plants, which are all in one group of plants. We'll get to that in a moment. It can kill a significant portion of the plant very rapidly. Almost every member of that group has a fast mechanism where it puts in an abscission layer and blocks the spread of it at some point. Mm. But that can be after a whole branch has died yeah. or in the case of a Loquat, which most people aren't thinking of as being in that family, but they are, it can kill a whole half of the tree. I've seen that happen before the plant finally manages to wall off the infection. The problem is that no, sprays don't work real well on it, at least not sprays that home gardeners have access to. I think copper is only used really as a barrier type of thing. Copper is a metal, which if the bacterial spore landed would be killed by it, but you got to spray it really thoroughly. Again, most home gardeners don't have the equipment to do that real well, and it isn't that effective. I think in the long run for fire blight, there's two approaches. One is to prune it out, either when you see it, which is really challenging, or just wait, watch how bad it is, wait until we get past that temperature range, 55 to 82 degrees. I remember that from plant pathology class that seems so specific that I can't forget it. Wow. 55 to I, 82 I guess, degrees. I and it, they're right, <laughs> 55 it hits and 82 or 85, let's say, it stops. And so once we're up into the mid 80s, it's not going to infect anymore. Now you can look at your poor tree and go, well, there's 30 points of infection that are up there that are blackened and dead, hence the name. Now I prune them all out, put them in a bag, put it in the trash, and that's my fire blight management for the season. Commercial growers use antibiotics. You mentioned that at the outset. Yeah. They use they use streptomycin sprays. Mm -hmm. Can we think of some problems with spraying <laughs> orchards with streptomycin over and over and over again? Well, resistance to streptomycin has developed in fire blight, and so that's a big issue for the industry. And I do know that some of the companies like Marone uh, have developed are working on developing biologicals for fire blight. I don't know of any that are on the market yet that have good efficacy. Okay. So right now we work with the pruning and then real important, select resistant varieties. In the case of pears, which are extremely 
susceptible to fire blight. Some of them, like Bartlett, the best known pair in the industry, on a scale of one to 10 for resistance, it's a one. It is extremely susceptible. Don't even plant a Bartlett pair. But there are some like Warren, Fan Still. Um, there's a couple of others that have very good fire blight resistance and I've grown them and it's correct. They might get a little tiny infection and the plant just walls it off immediately. You get a little two or three inch infection and that's it. Whereas on Bartlett, that whole branch is likely to die. So with pears, at least we do have good resistant varieties that you can choose. Apples, not so much because we don't have that many apple varieties that do that well here, but with pears, at least you have a good starting point to select resistant varieties. So, you know, it literally looks like you took a fire a, a blowtorch and burned it so it's very distinct so but once oh, yeah. it, once it's in you you could the plant of course is going to try to shut it off as much as possible so then you want to cut that section off and i think the rule is thumb rule of thumb is cut x number of inches past the last sign of infection is that yeah. something yeah so, yeah, if you're doing it during the period of infection, you cut down a few inches below that to where it's still, where it's still healthy green wood. Of course, you put that in a bag and you take it away. I have gotten counter uh, contradictory. You need to clean your pruners between cuts. Went to a long seminar by a very well-known plant pathologist who found that that really didn't make any difference. Others swear that it does. It certainly doesn't hurt. You know, you're doing a quick wipe with a with a light bleach solution or even something like Lysol on your pruners as you go from point to point. That's if you're doing it during the infection period. So there's the question: Is you're opening up an infection, a, a pruning cut, is that a point of infection? Apparently not. That doesn't seem to be a big deal. But going down far enough is really important. If you just want Want to wait? If you, want, you know, procrastination is a very well-approved horticultural strategy, and I do recommend. <laughs> in the case of fire blight, if you got a lot of pears and apples and stuff, and this happens every year, and it's worse some years than others, if you wait it out about the first of June, you're well past the infection period. Get up on a little ladder and just start pruning out the the parts that were killed by it that the plant finally walled off, and you can just get rid of it that way, just to prevent it from carrying over even worse to subsequent years. But also, just don't plant the varieties that are really susceptible to it in the case of pears. Yeah. And that's one of the things we keep coming back to. Yeah. And it also affects ornamental pears as, w- as well. So you'll see it on oh, yeah. ornamental pears yeah. because it, it affects the rose family. Um, yeah, everything that gets it is in the rose family. They're in the palm group of the rose family. So I don't want people to think that yeah. roses or even yeah. peaches or nectarines get it. So it's apples, pears, quince. Pyracantha, which yeah. is a common reservoir for it in your yard. If you have pyracanthas, they're really going to get it badly. Uh, some varieties like Santa Cruz don't. So if you really want pyracantha, just make sure you get Santa Cruz variety. Um, so you need, and then you mentioned the pears. There's two different kinds. There's so called, you know, the Bradford pear group, which some of which get it really badly. And also Pyrus kawakami, which is yeah. the evergreen pear. Yeah. We got a fair number of those around the Davis area mm-hmm. and they can get it pretty badly too. So again, on that, it's an ornamental. Just prune it out in the summer uh, to the best of your ability. Okay. All right. I think that calmed people down. I had someone who (laughs) came to me and was just so, so concerned about it because it does look pretty bad. I mean, it just, but, um, you know, it's, it's well, yeah, and in, in a susceptible variety, uh-huh. um, it can be really bad. I, yeah. I've grown 20, the Asian pears are a little subset uh, of pears, and yeah. 20th century is very popular. I'm probably going to take mine out. It's been, you know, 30 to 50 percent killed back by fire blight every single year. So as, it's a nice Asian pear, but I don't think it's worth that much hassle. Whereas the, I think it's Shinsiki or Shinko, one of the other two is quite resistant. So okay. just check the label for fire blight resistance on those. Okay. That's that. Yeah, that's good. Rec- recommendation. You were talking about how I'm sure you get so many citrus questions. I know Mm. I get so many citrus questions. And for me, I must say the big thing that I see is spindly growth with leaf drop. And every single time I have them take the bottom of the tree trunk and rock it back and forth. And Mm. almost always there's so much movement down below. Um, I mean, is that the same with, I mean, I know there are some diseases that affect citrus, but generally you see like a branch dying here and there 
but yeah, do you it's see- the, what you're describing. Uh, we have a problem in our industry. I hate to say this. I am a nursery owner, but we have a big problem, which is that demand for citrus trees outstrips supply every year, and they're slow to come on, and they're slow to root in, and people plant them improperly and plant them too deep. I think that's a quick summary of the problems yeah. right there. Then they water them incorrectly. So by the time I'm dealing with the problem, getting the pictures by email yeah. and, and trying to diagnose it, I can see this poor little plant has been struggling. It's trying to eke out an existence in what I'm now taking to call citrus deserts, where yeah. they've taken a corner of the yard and they've planted the citrus and they've run a little loop of drip irrigation line around it, usually the emitterized tubing, and they're running it three times a week for 20 minutes or something like that. And they want to know why their poor little citrus tree isn't growing. This is assuming it got past the problem you're describing, which was a poor root structure to begin yeah. with or improperly planted or planted too deeply. Uh, but they do need deep watering and the watering should expand outward as the tree grows and they need to be watered more like an orchard than like a garden. I guess that would be a summary right there. Okay. Water deeply, infrequently, as infrequently as your soil allows, wherever you're listening. And so citrus orchards are, are watered, a couple of inches of water, to use the, the agricultural jargon, every 10 to 20 days. They give them a very thorough soaking to go down a foot and a half, two feet deep or deeper. And then they go as long as they can before watering again to avoid that constant surface moisture that leads to crown rot and root rot problems, which are really a common issue with citrus, especially in heavy soils. Yeah, the heavy soils, I think, is key is people put them in clay soils and then they just surface water them. And then, yeah, and they also make the common mistake of amending the soil heavily because yeah. it's got clay. So then they're making a little bathtub exactly. <laughs> for the citrus. And its roots never expand outward. It lives in the bathtub because roots are lazy. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> they need to plant the native soil and then water correctly. Exactly. So what do you what what do you see for citrus? Like what are some of your common questions you get besides just that spindly growth, leaves falling off? Leaves looking weird. That's my <laughs> summary of the, of the of the three or four problems that you and I both encounter quite a lot. Citrus leaf miner, yes. which showed up in California, what, 15 years ago, I think it was, and hitchhiked up here from Southern California. And it it's actually kind of a funny little insect. It makes these little train track yeah. pattern in the leaf. The leaves do kind of curl a bit around. There's a little bit of a sheen to the leaf because of the way it, it mm-hmm. functions. And it's a, a moth. It's the larva of a moth. It doesn't show up until temperatures are pretty high. So we typically, I mark my calendar of the, the date of my first customer walking in with citrus leaf miner. And it's almost always right around the 1st of July, sometimes later, sometimes earlier. And they've, they've, they've got this horrible looking leaf because it's got this weird pattern on it and the leaves are curly and looking right. Rough. And, you know, there's really nothing to do about it that, that you would want to do. Uh-huh. And it doesn't actually hurt the tree. I know that sounds weird. The leaves are still photosynthesizing. It doesn't affect growth or yield. We do know that late season feeding with nitrogen going into the summer brings out more tender new growth, which is the only place they can oviposit, lay their eggs. And so we do know that heavy feeding of citrus in late summer or midsummer, I should say, can make it worse. Um, you can actually squish them if you got kids that want to do this. You know, find the little train track in the leaf, go to the end, squish it, you'll kill it. Okay, that can be fun, I guess. But we get 8, 10, 12 generations in the course of a summer here. Oh, geez. So if you're going to... If you're going to spray for it, you'd have to spray all the time. And it doesn't even work that well because it's in the leaf. Yeah, Yeah, Leaf miners are a real challenge. And is it spinosad that they recommend? Is that what? Yeah, that is the material that does work. And I know that lemon growers in the coastal areas where it hits earlier and goes longer and they think it actually does affect their yield and quality, they'll start trapping with pheromone traps, which you can buy if you're interested in this. And they start to show up there. You start spraying. They use spinosad. And, you know, that's although it's organic, it is a broad spectrum insecticide. So you are doing some harm to beneficials when you use it. It's not perfect. Bees, too, right? Bees. So you never want to use it when it's flowering. That's what I. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so fortunately, these show up well after the yeah. bloom period, but there may be bees in the area in your garden. I could see this could be a real challenge to spray. And again, it isn't really affecting anything except the appearance of the leaves. So that's yeah. one, it's kind of a cosmetic thing. I should mention that along with it, a, unreal, un, a, a similar but 
not the same insect called a peel miner did come in. Oh. You'll occasionally, I think in my whole career, I've seen three of those. Yeah. And one of them was on one of them was on one of my trees. <laughs> so <laughs> that doesn't really count. And it just does the same thing in the peel and it never gets past the epidermis of the peel. And so it doesn't even really get into the fruit and it's very uncommon, but I've seen a couple of those. People might read about it. So there's really not much to do or worry about in the case of the leaf miner. That's our theme here. Don't worry about yeah, it. Yeah, don't worry about but, it. <laughs> don't worry about it. Don't forget but you can, about it. About the, it. Other, the other the other thing is the curled leaves that are yeah. all distorted, mm-hmm. and that's from thrips. Thrips can be very challenging, and they're much worse some years than other years. Again, they don't really hurt the tree all that much. The leaves are, are weird looking, but they're still photosynthesizing. They can cause us a, a here's a technical technical term, a scurfy appearance scurfy. on the fruit at like times. <laughs> Particularly Satsuma mandarins will get it, navel oranges. If you ever looked at an orange, it has a little area that looks just scarred, but is otherwise fine. You know, you peel it and everything is fine. That's probably from thrips. They're very challenging to deal with. If I were a commercial grower of citrus, I'd probably be doing light oil sprays at the time that the thrips are migrating off the grasses onto the orchard, which is mid to late spring. How effective that is, I'm not absolutely sure. I'm sure I'll find out at some point. But um, we do see it a lot worse some years, not so bad other years. It's, again, it's just causing this deformity on the leaves. So it's not really affecting the thing you're growing the tree for. It doesn't hurt the blossoms, doesn't hurt the fruit particularly all that much. So those are the two things that cause weird leaves. So as we're talking, one of, and and I'll move on from citrus, but I think the question that to me is actually sort of vague and I and I have like this whole long list of possibilities is <laughs> when your fruit isn't as sweet as you think it should be. Well, yeah, um, there could be a lot of reasons for that. And I've run into that. Varieties do differ. Yeah. Public taste, taste differs. Uh-huh. I am growing four or five kinds of mandarins and I take them in for the staff and the customers to sample and I get quite a range of preference on the citrus that I bring in. Uh, the people that made the amazingly successful marketing program with the cuties oh, yeah. mandarin, oh. there's actually three different mandarins in that program, but they did a lot of testing to see what people wanted. And what they wanted was sweet. They didn't really want tart. And most of us who have what I will call more sophisticated citrus <laughs> fruit palate, <laughs> we want a balance of sweet and tart. You mentioned at the start of the show you like nectarines more than yeah. peaches. Well, it's not just it's not just the fuzz on that. Nectarines tend to have a different flavor profile, a little yeah. more acidity. To yeah. them. And that balance of sweet and tart is what a lot of people are after. So that is one difference is that people's preferences differ. People from different parts of the world, I've noticed, have very distinct preferences. Mm-hmm. Some like more sweet, less tart. Some like that more complex flavor, as I like to call it. Uh, so that's part of it. But if a tree isn't growing well, if it is stressed, if it doesn't have full sun, it won't have as much sugar in the fruit. Okay. And so that's okay. one factor right there. How you're growing it, a healthy, well-grown tree will probably have better flavored fruit in the case of citrus. The other factor is temperature. Mm-hmm. We don't pick our satsumas until December down here in the valley, at least in general. Uh, up in Penryn and Newcastle, they can pick them in November because they get colder nights, which converts some of the acid to sugar and increases the flavor profile to what the public wants. So that is a factor with some citrus. Okay. Chilling actually brings out the flavor of the fruit. This is why your friends in the Bay Area can't grow good citrus. Yeah. It's never never warm enough for the sugar, never cool enough to get that flavor profile. Interesting. Okay. Um, yeah, it's just a question I get a lot. And sometimes I even say you might be leaving it on the tree too long. You know, oh, yeah. if it starts dehydrating yes. and it gets that mealy, you know, they're like, oh, I'm not sure if it's ripe. And that's why I always tell people, I, I and I hear citrus growers, I mean, they joke around. They're like, oh, how do I know when to pick my citrus? I give one to my granddaughter. And if she's like, mm, this is good, <laughs> then we know it's time to harvest. So I'm like, she's, she's better than a spectrophotometer. Yeah, exactly. It's as simple as <laughs> well, that. <laughs> well, that's absolutely true. There are some varieties. I'm actually looking into planting several acres of citrus. And I'm reading about all these different mandarins in particular. And some of them are described as having good hang time or hanging well into the summer. Most of them don't. Most of them have a pretty narrow window for when they're very good. Satsuma mandarins from my trees are great from early December to mid-January. After that, they start getting sweeter but less flavorful. They lose the acidity. They lose the complexity of flavor. Well, good news, my clementines are beginning to ripen then. And then comes the mercot and then comes the tango. And tango and gold nugget are said to hang well into the early summer. I haven't had that experience. Oh, wow. I don't have them yet, so I'll find out. Okay. But that means what that means in the citrus biz is they keep a good flavor uh-huh. into the early summer. Yeah. So 
Um, oh my gosh, there's so much. So I'm, I'm having to, as we're talking, I'm, things are coming to my mind and I do want to hit <laughs> one because it's just, it, it, it basically makes me not want to grow apples, which is the mm. coddling moth. Yeah. Um, anything to be done? That's yeah, that's yeah, relatively raise, this is easy. Lazy, I've been lazy. told I've been told this by permaculture folks and organic gardeners, and I'm told this is actually true. Raise chickens under your apple trees. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, some of us can do know. that. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. There is another. There is another. Yes, coddling moth is the worm that gets in the apple. They know exactly, by the way, when the coddling moth begins to fly. It's a temperature related thing. You can go to the great UCANR IPM website on at UC Davis. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think uh, I think I got all of it except for the dot edu right yeah, there yeah, and you, you can you yeah. can <laughs> look at all the models for how growers figure out when they should start putting traps out to figure out whether they should spray spinosad once again is the go-to spray for it people get pretty good results with that and that's okay if you don't mind spraying your tree two three four times oh. depending on what's showing up in your <laughs> traps yeah and what i have found is that i have a lot of customers who don't want to do any of that stuff yeah. they don't want to spray anything so they bag some fruit oh i and- I was going to say, I'm like, and then there's crazy things where they tell you to bag your fruit. (laughs) Yep. And it works. This is the thing is, you know, when I first talked to someone who did this, I said, wait, you do what? And she gets up on a stepladder and she takes, she was just using number four sandwich bags, you know, the the small size Uh paper sandwich bags. And she slips it over. She would say she'd do two or three dozen of them, slip it over, fold it over, staple it. And she knew that she'd have... Well, 30 apples that had no worms in them. And that was fine. She said, it takes me just about as long as it would take me to haul out a sprayer, mix up the spray, spray the tree. And her answer was, it also never got great results for doing that because the timing is so challenging. Mm -hmm. And so she just found, and you can buy, if you have a significant other who's really into apples, you can buy very elegant fruit bags (laughs) online for Christmas and give them to them. And they can have them, they just slip on like a little little slipper that you might wear. Uh And that goes over the fruit and it works just fine as well but you can also use number four sandwich bags you got to get on there before the worms are in the fruit that's the key thing and they will start to infest as soon as the fruit is developing in many years it depends on the temperature so you can't know absolutely but once you see those little fruit forming out there you just go slip a few bags over them and it really does work i'm always amazed at how how cheap produce really is at the store when you grow it at home, and I mean, if can you imagine if farmers had to bag every fruit? And then I'm always like, oh my god, what are they spraying on to allow us to have all mm-hmm. these? You know, so it's it's you know, yeah. In the, in the past, it was common organic phosphates <laughs> and, and organic farmers would use spinosad. And the only concern I have with that, I mean, spinosad is a very low toxicity material as far as people go, but it does it is broad spectrum. I mean, yeah. that's a term that we use for a spray that kills pretty much anything in its vicinity. It's not selective. It doesn't kill just the coddling moth. Yeah. And so when you do that, you're going to be killing the beneficial yeah. insects. And very Most people, I, I don't know, as longer I've been in business in Davis, I have fewer and fewer customers who are even interested in spraying for a problem. They'd rather just grow something else if they'd have to spray. Yeah. So why not just put some bags on the fruit? There you go. There you go. It's <laughs> funny because this, I, I, I decided that I should be the person to go through our chemical cabinets at work. And mm. which have not been gone through in over 40 years. Uh, yeah, probably some things in there that I was using. <laughs> uh, were you using straight nicotine? That's the one that made me go, oh my God, if I drop this, we're all dead. Uh, but yes, nicotine sulfate. Yep. Yes. It, it, but just today, a student was like looking through and was like, what's this? Uh, first of all, I'm like, uh, it's Bordeaux. But he's like, what's this mm-hmm. Bordeaux? Uh, and I'm like, you don't know what Bordeaux spray is? And that's funny that you mentioned that because yep. I'm like, that's the little, you know, I mean, most people know it for grapevines, but. Um, Bordeaux yeah. was the that was the original copper spray. Yes. You mix copper with what is it, sli- hydrated lime, yes. and you pound them together. Uh-huh. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we have it easy, kids. We have it easy. You guys have it easy these That's days. Right. Um, one thing, I, and I don't want to keep you. I mean, we could go on and on forever. But one thing is just the sad news about some of your stone fruits is when you see sap oozing from the tree. Yeah. 
And, and it can be, I remember the legendary urban horticulturist in Sacramento, Pam Bone, yes. once describing all of the 11 different things I think it was that could cause sap to be oozing from your tree, ranging from a kid hitting it with sticks to flathead borers to yeah. bacterial canker and so on. So there can, it's, a, it's just an, a tree's reaction to injury of some sort mm -hmm. or infection. And you can't just from the sap being oozing out tell exactly what's going on. Now, something about the pattern may tell you something. Like if it's oozing in a stained pattern that's moving slowly up the trunk, that's probably Phytophthora. If it's one area that got sunburned and there's a bunch of oozing and frass, which is our technical term for caterpillar poop, yeah. then that means, or, or any kind of poop, that means you've got some kind of borers in there. And that would be more of a challenge. Borers can be very challenging and, and there's really no spray for it. You just do the, what, the best you can to clean the area up. Oftentimes at that point, people do paint over the area area simply with a white latex paint to prevent any further sunburn, not to kill the borers or anything, but just almost always when I see borers on a fruit tree, it started out as sunburn. So to prevent it, to prevent that problem, painting the tree when you plant it, this is why you see that done in orchards, or just protecting it with a tree guard, which is more common these days, this is wrapped around the trunk to protect the tree in its first couple of years, that will greatly reduce the incidence of borers on a young tree. Most commonly on an older tree, what's happened is like your peach, set too much fruit, and you didn't thin it, and a branch broke, and all of a sudden, the interior part of the tree is exposed to sun that was not previously exposed to sun. And you get sunburn. And I remember sitting through a seminar once about borers where he showed that borers will find that sunburn spot within 24 hours. Oh they will gosh. be in there. They're attracted to heat. They're attracted to light. And they'll be in there already infesting it right away. So if that happens, one of the simplest things you can do when suddenly wood has been exposed by improper pruning or more commonly the tree pruning itself is whitewash that that wood okay. really quickly this interior white latex mixed with water is fine uh, not anything thicker than that you're just trying to prevent sunburn on wood that has suddenly become exposed because honestly borers are kind of usually the beginning of the end for yeah. a fruit tree yeah yeah usually when i see oozing on the main trunk i just tell yeah. people it's a matter of time if yeah. it's on a limb possibly they could prune it out in catch, yeah, and they should. Yeah, yeah, they probably should go ahead and take that out. And here's the thing. A tree with, with these problems can go on producing fruit for a surprisingly long time. Know, so, yeah. you know, try to correct the problem that caused it if you can. But if it's your favorite old apricot tree and you need that variety, well, go ahead and plant a new one 10, 20 feet away protect the trunk when you do yeah. you can get a couple more years at least out of that apricot you can probably get it two three four years full the new one is growing and making the fruiting wood which takes about three years on an apricot yeah. then you take the old one out so i had a cherry tree that went on 12 years with only half a cambium that's so funny i was about to tell you i had two cherry trees that sapped one year and by the end of the season they were dead <laughs> yeah. you never know how fast yeah. it's gonna go you never know. that's what i tell people i said you know it just depends on how much fruit set and you know if yeah. it's setting good fruit why pull it out but if it's not yeah. pull it out well, they, get ahead, their concern know? often would be is it going to spread from the one uh, tree to the other true. probably not yeah. it was it was the initial problem was an yeah. environmental factor and that gets to a really core thing here whenever you're dealing with a disease or a past yeah. you know you go back to that same thing you learn in first plant pathology lecture the disease triangle which is that you have an interaction of the host mm -hmm. and the pest and the environment and the one thing home gardeners can usually manage well is the environment. It's the sunburn that causes yes. the borers to get yeah. in. So you try to prevent sunburn or you correct it if there's a likelihood of it happening because of the limb breakage. And that goes for a lot of the other things we've talked about. Brown rot on apricots, thinning the tree for better airflow, pruning trees up for better air circulation underneath them can actually reduce the likelihood of infection. So you can work on the environment to make it less likely that a disease or a pest is going to attack it. True. I'm going to leave you with a question and, um, and it could, I have a very small sample, um, of it, but I had in my mini orchard, I had an apricot that maybe flowered like five flowers, but it was huge and it was grafted and I had another mm. apricot and, and I, you know, I'm like, look at if, you know, I was talking to my tree. I'm like, look at, if you don't do something <laughs> next year. I'm cutting you all the way down and we're going to see what happens. And I cut it all the way down and it grew huge. Well, the mini orchard we have at the conservatory, the same thing is happening with one of the apricots too. So twice yep. now I have an apricot and it sounds like maybe you already know the answer. It's not rootstock taking over. I'm, I, but it's huge. 
barely yeah, I have, two flowers. I have one. Yep, I have one just like that, and it's my fault because for many years we sold an excellent variety for the Sacramento Valley called Harcot. Harcot oh. was touted for its brown rot resistance, which it okay. did have. There's no question. 10, 12, oh, more than that. About 15 years ago, my Harcot just gradually stopped flowering correctly and stopped fruiting. And I have assumed all these years that it was a chilling hours uh-huh. or chilling portions issue. The tree is great. It's a, if, it's if I wanted a shade tree, yeah. it would be fabulous. It's about 30 by 30. It's a wonderful yes. tree. I finally figured this out because I went out when it had a whole bunch of bud. I mean, it was going to be what they call in the business popcorn bloom. Uh-huh. And I I watched the buds and they failed to open correctly. So that told me that it was a chilling hour problem. That's what happens when they don't get correct chilling. They don't leave exit dormancy correctly. You may also see delayed foliation, but the most common thing is the flowers just don't open and don't pollinate. This year, this year, 2023, for the first time in 20 years, I went out this morning and took a picture of a half dozen blooms on my Harcot tree. Okay. <laughs> so we got about 1,200 chilling hours here in the Dixon area this year, more than we've had in quite a long time, and it kind of confirms to me that that variety needs more chilling than we normally get here. Used to fruit fine in the 80s and into the early 90s. If you want a nice marker for climate change, uh-huh. there it is. Harcot variety no longer fruits well here. I knew you would know it, but it also <laughs> happens to be a huge tree. Yeah. Oh, it's a great big apricot tree. Yes. <laughs> if it said a lot okay. of fruit, I don't know what I would do with all of it. <laughs> okay. So it's not just, okay, wow, it's huge because it's not fruiting. It goes, it's just a big tree and it just happens yep. to not be fruiting because of the yep. chill. Okay. I'm going to have to look at, I don't have the one, you know, I'm not living on that property anymore. And I chopped that one down too at my <laughs> property. Cause I'm like, screw you tree. Um, Oh, yeah. If I were limited for space, this thing would have gone years ago. But where it is, it's a lovely tree, and I think it's very pretty. I just call it my rare fruitless apricot. There we go. Okay. The one at work, (laughs) the one at work, I like, you know, remove some major limbs because it just happened to be along the walkway, too. I'm like, great. The largest trees along the walkway. So I don't think it's blooming yet. I'm going to have to take a look at it. And then. Yeah, look close. I was quite surprised. I like to go out and take pictures of the fruit trees when they first come into bloom. And I was taking pictures of my nectar plum and my beautiful almonds and all the plums. And I looked over and said, wait a minute, this is the first time I've seen a bloom on that tree in at least 15 years. So it's going to, I might get some fruit. I'll let you know if I actually get fruit on Harcot this year. I'm not going to say if I get fruit. Yeah. If we get fruit this year, which is fruit for us is basically it starts developing and then the squirrels on campus come and get it. So, you know, it doesn't, um, but I'm not going to say it's going to stay there because, no. uh, you know, what are the chances we get this many chilling hours next year? Well, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, we've, we've had we've had a couple of years of very high chilling hours, which yeah. is unusual. I think what the, the, the station nearest to Dixon actually has recorded close to 1,400 chilling oh hours. We gosh. average we average 800 to 850 in the Davis area, and that's been very consistent over the years with a few years where it's lower than that. And so that's what people should count on. And that's a whole other show that's for you, talking about show. chilling hours and yeah. chilling portions. Yeah. All that kind of thing. But yeah, this apricot would go. And there's plenty of apricots. Blenheim. I mean, why yeah. would you plant any other apricot if you had a broom and, and, and the inclination that's, for a Blenheim? That is what, that's the one that I had next to this one. <laughs> and it yeah. produced and that's, you know, I, when I first moved here, I couldn't understand what all the fuss was about until I finally started learning when they're ripe uh-huh. and tasting them right off the tree. Yeah. is an amazing apricot. Yeah. It's a Yolo County specialty. Yeah, it's really good. Um, well, there you go. We ended it with, I cannot stump Don Shore. <laughs> Not that I wanted to, but I'm like, I knew it. And uh, that's, that's, I didn't even think about that. I thought you were going to, I, I don't know, I, it, just because it was so huge too. So, um, yeah, it's probably my fault. I probably sold it to whoever lived in that house 25 years ago. I used to sell a lot of our Yeah, Africa. my gosh. Wait a minute. I might have bought it from Redwood Barn. Yeah. So it's yeah. quite possible. And yeah. I began to realize people were coming back and telling me about this problem oh, with this variety. They? And I realized okay. my own was doing the same thing. So. I mean, I'll take the I'll take the fall for this one. I mean, I was embarrassed. I kept it to myself. I wasn't gonna be like, I'm like, what am I doing wrong? This is and then wasn't until like this tree. And I'm like, I, I've seen this before. I know what's happening, but I don't know what's happening. Um, so um Don Shore, owner of Redwood Barn Nursery in Davis. If you're close by Davis, uh go there. I mean, don't pepper him with so many questions because <laughs> I mean, I'm sure everyone does that, but um, great nursery. And, but you're also on radio. Where can yep. people hear you? 
KDRT, which is local in Davis, 95.7 FM, and we podcast the Davis Garden Show every week. Lois Richter and I do that. I also go. throw in that I do a jazz program on that radio station as well. There you go, multifaceted. I can't say that I do anything uh, musically at all. Uh, oh, I don't play the jazz. I just play records oh, you just of jazz. Play? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and then, do you still have your blog, right? Blog, yes, website, uh, yes. Yep, blog, and then the, the website has got a lot of the information we talked about, yes. redwoodbarn.com. Yes. yes, and then sometimes when I'm Googling things, you're the first thing that comes up, and I'm like, oh. as it should be. Um, <laughs> so, um, so everyone, yes, uh, check it out, wealth of information. I couldn't stump them, um, and uh, You'll hear if you go on tour at the conservatory, you'll hear me talk about the Wibwitchia and how Don Shore put it in this uh ter- We should give you we should have given you the terracotta pot, but but we broke it. So oh well. Well maybe a little you had to break the, you had to break the pot to repot it. I wouldn't be yeah, surprised. No, That's about four yeah. decades in there. I don't even know if there's any soil left in it. I think it was just roots. But well the uh, other thing I should tell you as a joke, a little note is that one of the things I really did when I worked there is I tried to bring in a lot of different kinds of Psych ads. Oh my. Okay. <laughs> no, you did not. Okay. Yep. All right. So just today, I'm like, we got to get rid of some of these psych ads. I hate them. <laughs> they hurt me. This is yes. ridiculous. But yeah, that's my fault too. I'll take the blame for that one in your apricot. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's hilarious. So, all right. On that note, everyone, until next time, happy gardening. <laughs>